The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in the Global Buildings Performance Network. Today, we're very fortunate to have Ryan Mears, Hans Olaf Carlson Herzog, Jens Lotzen, and John Lee joining us. This great group of panelists will be discussing the Getting Building Codes Right Implementation and Enforcement. Now, one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And I just want to go over some of the webinar features today. You do have two options for audio. You can either listen through your computer or over your telephone. So if you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. By doing that, you'll just eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you select the telephone option to call in today, a box on the right side will display the number and audio pin that you should use. Panelists, we just ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if anyone has technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the phone number at the bottom of that slide, which is 888-259-3826. And now we encourage the audience at any point to submit questions. Um, just feel free to type them into the question box, which is in the GoToWebinar pane. Um, at any point throughout the webinar, and I will present those questions to the panelists at the end. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, we did post PDF copies of the presentations at the URL posted on that slide, and that is cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you can use those to follow along. Also, within a day or two of the, today's webinar, we will post an audio recording to that site. Now, we do have a great agenda prepared for you today that's going to explore the current barriers to implementing rigorous enforcement systems for new buildings and present examples of good enforcement, other best practices for measures for supporting implementation, and then lessons learned from implementing such measures. And before our speakers begin their presentations, I just want to go over some a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. And then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session and then some closing remarks and a very brief survey. Now this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be. The Solution Center is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial and is supported through a partnership with UN Energy. It was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the US, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique partnership include support of developing countries through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you're attending today. Now, there are four primary goals for the Solution Center. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Uh, it also serves to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. The Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enables expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. So our primary audience for this is uh, energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But then the Solutions Center also strives to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And this slide highlights our Ask an Expert feature that the Solutions Center offers. So Ask an Expert is a great service offered through the Solutions Center at zero cost. So we've established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries. So for example, in the area of energy efficiency in buildings, we're very pleased to have Cesar Trevino, the leader of the Mexico Green Building Council, serving as our expert. So if you have a need for policy assistance on energy efficiency in buildings or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this useful service, which again is provided free of charge. So to request assistance, you simply submit your request by registering through our Ask an Expert feature at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to uh, those in your networks and organizations that may be interested. 
So in summary, we would encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the expert policy assistance, subscribe to our newsletter, and participate in webinars like these. And now I'd like to provide some brief introductions for our panelists today. Uh, the first panelist that we'll be hearing from is Jan Lassen, the Technical Director of the Global Buildings Performance Network. And then following him, we will hear from Ryan Mears, a Senior Code Compliance Specialist with the Institute for Market Transformation, where he works with state and local governments to improve compliance with building energy codes. He also works on the development of code change proposals to improve the understanding of the application of the International Energy Conservation Code to renovations. And then following Ryan, we will hear from John Lee. John is the Deputy Director for Green Buildings and Energy Efficiency at the New York City Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability. In this capacity, he is leading the city's policy and legislative efforts, driving the built environment to unprecedented energy efficiency standards. And then our final speaker today is Hans Olaf Carlson Schiller. Um, of the Swedish National Board of Housing, Building, and Planning. Hans is head of the unit for the Sustainable Buildings and Construction Process. And so with those brief introductions, uh, please join me in welcoming Jens to the webinar. Sorry, we needed to get the microphone back on. Um, as said, I'm Jens Larsen. I'm the Technical Director of the Global Buildings Performance Network. Uh, I sit here in Paris. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, we have been working with building codes for nearly two years, and uh, as part of this we have been scoring some of the best building codes against uh, each other and try to come up with um, building codes that really drive the um, building consumption towards a zero or at least bringing it very, very close uh, to a zero or bringing it uh, significantly down. But all of these uh, measures are nothing worth if the building code just stays as the prettiest paper in the world, then needs to have both implementation and enforcement. So therefore we saved one of the best parts to this last uh, webinar. Let me dive into it. What is uh, the idea of getting building codes right? We would like to, through these webinars, to, say, uh, to share best practice experience on how to do things. Um, it's as practical and as much about development and implementation uh, of state-of-the-art building codes as possible. Uh, we tried to bring some of the best experts together to tell you about their experience by developing the building code. And as we heard already in the two previous webinars, this is a difficult task and there is a lot of stakeholders. And if we don't get them all in dialogue, as it's shown on this uh, slide, then it's difficult to get it right. We started out this series with uh, discussing the importance of having targets and frequently revisions of building codes. So it's not just about establishing a very good building code and then we are safe for many years. No, you need to drive it forward and as innovation go forward, we need to implement this and get better and better building codes. All of our 25 building codes have very good elements of this type uh, built in. The second one is when you come close to a zero uh, or you want to walk towards a zero, you need to go to performance in the end. You cannot continue just tightening the individual elements in your building code, but at a certain point you need to look at the building as a machine, try to look at how can we really drive the last bytes of the energy consumption down so that we, we maybe end with our zero or positive energy. Again, we found a lot of very good experience from our 25 uh, building codes and we presented some of it in the last webinar. The last one where we look at enforcement and learning from the best practice experience in trying to set up regimes like this, trying to control that people actually follow the building codes and see how this really uh, comes from the paper 
out in the real world. That we found out in the process of uh, looking at building codes, this is actually one of the most tricky and most challenging uh, parts of building codes. It's where you have to work with communities, you have to work with uh, citizens, you have to work with media, you have to work with everybody to get this in place and, and you need to do training and many other things. Uh, we put the webinars uh, online on our website and you can download them and we're working at uh, making short extractions so it becomes easier to get the bytes that you, you really want. Uh, we also expect to do more of this in a paper version so that you can download a small paper trying to summarize both what we learned in the study before but also what we learned from these uh, webinars. As I said, we had the most challenging task when we started to compare how well are these uh, codes implemented. When we looked at some of the other elements, we got scores on 10 and 9 and if, if uh, not so good, the best were at 8. But when we looked at the performance, we came to the conclusion that all the countries have a lot to learn in particular this field. Um, one of the elements that we found was often missing was the focus on this problem. So when we asked jurisdictions, do you have an, an evaluation on the uh, implementation of your building code? How many percent of the new buildings are actually fulfilling uh, the requirements in the building code. Uh, it was very weak what we got back. And especially when we say, are those sources independent or is it just uh, people telling, we think the building codes are working very well. So therefore, we came out with relatively poor uh, scorings in the implementation. We also here, I stress it by putting the three elements of implementation next to each other. So there is the implementation and enforcement of the standard itself. There is certification. And the last one is the policy packages, which is supporting building codes. When we looked first at the enforcement standards, that's where we scored quite bad in all jurisdictions. And only Sweden came above and the five, which is uh, the medial uh, score that was possible. Uh, we come back to these uh, examples and, and we hope to hear more about these kind of challenges and why it's not so well evaluated. Certification was a place where we found more uh, and where some countries do uh, relatively fine. And again, uh, we found there was still missing some elements in doing the right policy package to drive your building code so that we get better and better performance and better and better building codes. The uh, uh, a special challenge which we tried to look at and we hope to illustrate a bit more here today was when you go from prescriptive building codes and you go to more performance based building codes uh, in your revision cycles, what is the lessons and what is new in in implementation of a more performance-based building code, which is maybe more complex. Uh, we looked at um, uh, how to these changes are reflected in the regimes, what models are used for enforcement, what finance mechanisms could drive this, what about training, education, awareness, and what about the final uh, question, does this really give savings in the buildings in the end? Is the metered consumption also going down? It was a question we looked into, but it was very difficult to come up with the, the true story about this. We still see building codes as a very, very important part of building policies for new buildings, um, but it has to be a mix of sticks, carrots, and tambourines, we used to say. So the minimum requirements are the stick that we try to apply on people. You have to do this, otherwise we come after you. And the next one is the carrots, the, the, the benefits that you get out of the building code, the finance system, the subsidy. And finally, the tambourines where we give the message, this is a good idea for you, for the planet, for the people living in the building, and everybody. So we try to come around these kind of elements also when we talk about building codes. 
Uh, I hope all of the speakers here will stick with the idea of talking about how to implement building code and enforce them and how you have been either successful or challenged in this process and what can be learned from it. I think that was what I would uh, bring here. Uh, I hope to come back in the end with a very few concluding uh, words, uh, but otherwise I would leave the, the screen to the true experts, the people who work with this in their daily work. The first one I would hand over to is uh, Ryan Myers from the Institute for Market Transformation in the U.S. Yes, good morning everyone. I'm loading up my presentation here and I'll get started. Um, so thanks Jens. Uh, that was a great introduction to, um, to the webinar uh, series and, and what we're trying to do in terms of addressing the enforcement issue and, and how to implement um, energy codes. So my presentation today is going to look at uh, a U.S. perspective on, on what we're trying to do for uh, building energy codes uh, enforcement. First a quick overview. Before I dive into the enforcement issue, I'm going to look at, uh, do a quick overview of how codes are developed and adopted in the U.S. Uh, it's, it's important to, to give the context of development and adoption in order to really understand why enforcement uh, is an issue here and, and is one that we're trying to tackle and believe that there are significant uh, energy savings from that. So then I'll address some of the barriers that we that I come across in terms of enforcing the code and then uh, provide some solutions uh, as I see them. So first of all, for uh, development of energy codes in the U.S., it's important to note that the U.S. does not have a mandatory uh, national energy code. The U.S. has what are referred to as model codes, and model codes are developed by two non-governmental organizations. One is ASHRAE, and they develop standard 90.1, and also uh, ICC, or the International Code Council, and they develop the International Energy Conservation Code. And uh, each of those are on a three-year development cycle, so the new codes are published every three years. And the process is open to all interested parties, uh, which is why it be often becomes uh, quite complex and tedious because anyone can provide input into the development of the codes. Uh, and ultimately, uh, governmental uh, building officials are who, who vote for the, the final version of the code. When it comes to adoption of energy codes in the U.S., it's largely a state-level activity. Uh, there are a few exceptions where uh, local jurisdictions, uh, cities and counties are responsible for adopting a code and not the state. And often when the states adopt codes, they'll make amendments. Uh, they, they like to change the code up to be specific to construction practices um, within their state. The map here is put out by the Building Codes Assistance Project and it is uh, it basically covers the what level of uh, energy code each state has uh, for all the uh, 50 states in the US. So now we dive into uh, the enforcement side of things. Enforcement within the US is a largely a local or a city or county level responsibility. Um, it's compliance is most commonly verified by local government officials. Uh, they do this by conducting a review of construction plans and also uh, conducting on-site inspections to verify compliance. Now, that's really where the issues uh, come in. I show an example here of New York State, and this is the, a map of each of the counties in New York State. And then the image to the right shows uh, Orange County which is one county within the state, and in Orange County alone there's 44 uh, cities and towns. And each of those cities and towns has the authority to enforce uh, a building code, the for to enforce the state building code. So that's where you start to see that there are, the, the reason that enforcement has not been addressed and, and is is often shied away from because it's a very difficult issue to tackle. There's in across the entire US there's over 3,000 counties and then there's over 30,000 local jurisdictions which includes uh, cities and towns and villages. So there's a, it's, it's, there's a significant uh, need for outreach to a very, very large audience of, of building officials who ultimately enforce the codes in every single uh, city and town across the U.S. So of course the, 
the reason that we're interested in this is that there's energy savings potential uh, from good energy code enforcement. Even the, even the best code on paper uh, really doesn't mean much until it gets adopted and then uh, enforced effectively. So this map here is actually from the IMT website. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of the page that, will, that has the full report. Basically, in last year, IMT did a, um, a study of all 50 states to determine what the energy savings potential was. And we didn't look at it as uh, from a, a baseline of the current code. We looked at it from if the, if the state enforced the code that they're under now, if they did it to, if they improved their compliance rate by 25%, what would the savings be? And if they improved it by 75%, what would the savings be? So that gives an idea. Um, at the top, I, I cite $37.1 billion in lifetime savings for just five years of bringing uh, construction into full compliance with the energy codes that are in place now. So next, we start to look at the, uh, at the barriers. So obviously, there's a lot of barriers that exist when it comes to uh, enforcing the energy code. Uh, I think the one, the most common, I think, universal barrier, uh, regardless of country, is, is really a lack of knowledge of the code and, and inadequate training uh, provided to bring both code officials and also design professionals up to speed on what the energy code is at, at, with you know, a revision cycle of every three years. Um, and there are some states who will adopt every three years. Um, it's often a big task for code officials and design professionals and builders to get up to speed on what the current code is. Next is, um, is inadequate funding. I think this is also a significant problem, but it's not one that, that cannot be overcome. Uh, the next one, lack of political will, uh, is definitely a, a major issue that we come across uh, here in the U.S. And it, sometimes it can be tough to overcome lack of political will. Um, you know, global warming and climate change has become a very uh, political issue here in the U.S. and uh, a very polarizing one. And so, unfortunately, energy energy efficiency and energy code get lumped in with that, and often uh, there's not uh, political will to really enforce the energy code. And then various paths for compliance. Now, this is having multiple paths for demonstrating compliance. Um, it can be a barrier. But I would, it, it could also be lumped in with lack of knowledge uh, and training, which it frequently is. Um, you have a prescriptive path where you can simply follow the code, what the code says um, and specify that on your plans, or a performance path where you're actually conducting um, an energy model to demonstrate compliance. And then the third one is an outcome-based um, compliance path. And this is not yet in the model codes. It is being proposed. Um, but this is an outcome-based path is one that will look specifically at uh, at measured performance. So after the building is constructed, um, have you met the target that the code has set in place um, and therefore demonstrate compliance um, after the building's been occupied? And then the last one is not knowing what compliance issues exist. This is one that we're coming across uh, more and more frequently in that building officials, they, they just don't really know where to start in terms of addressing issues because they don't know what issues they have uh, within their jurisdiction. So that brings us to our first uh, solution slide. And the, the, one of the biggest recommendations that I make is to conduct an assessment. You really need to determine what is broke in order to know how to fix it. And when it comes to an, uh, an, an assessment for building energy codes, there's really two, um, two areas. And one is a quantitative assessment. This is, kind of a, this is one that allows you to compare you know, what your compliance number is versus other jurisdictions. Uh, it really is a, it involves reviewing plans, doing on-site inspections, and just checking for what has been submitted and what, what code violations are observed on-site versus what the code requirement is. So that gives you a number that says you have a 80% or a 50% compliance rate. Um, and that's really just an estimated number, but it gives you an idea of where you, where you are and where you need to go. The second one, which is really more in depth, is a qualitative assessment, and that uncovers the reason of why. Um, so, for example, there maybe there's a lack of documentation. Maybe um, maybe design professionals are not required to submit um, the the appropriate documentation on their plans that shows that they're in compliance. Uh, it could be a lack of knowledge uh, from the design professionals or from uh, building officials. 
or it could be a poor process, um, or it could be uh, political priorities that are uncovered that is the reason for noncompliance. So quantitative really gets to the number, but the qualitative side really gets at um, why those things are happening, why the compliance level is where it is. So then you need to uh, develop a plan. You use the assessment as a means to, um, to see where the issues lie in order to develop a plan to improve that. So that you, you want to address both the, the quantitative issues. So if you, if you observed uh, within your assessment that uh, fenestration or, or, or um, insulation is the most commonly cited violation, you want to focus uh, some training efforts uh, for, your, for industry and also for, um, for your code officials on how to address that, what the code requirements are, and what they should be looking for. But you should also draw from established best practices. And I show down here, there's five uh, images of case studies. These are covers of case studies that I've done over the past two years that, uh, that really pull out what we've seen across the US as best practice examples of how to implement uh, and enforce the energy code. And they, they kind of range in topics from um, how to use third parties for plan review, um, how, to, how to use design professionals, how to make design professionals um, more accountable when it comes to um, code compliance, especially energy code compliance. And it also looks at local government processes. Um, often local governments uh, in the US, and especially building departments, um, they're underfunded and they frequently don't have um, you know, the most recent advances in technology to allow them to do things more efficiently. Um, so that, that looks at some technological um, innovations that will improve the compliance process um, and thereby making code officials and, and building departments more efficient so that they can then take on um, the, the task of enforcing the energy code more effectively. Now I'll go into one example of the uh, case studies. And this is, uh, the example here is from the state of Georgia. Um, the state of Georgia implemented um, a state level requirement for duct and envelope leakage testing for all residential construction of three stories or less. It's required that the testing be done by someone who's certified. Um, it does not specifically have to be a third party individual. Uh, a builder could get certified and, um, and conduct their own testing. Um, and that, of course, that would be verified by the local code official, but it would allow the builder to test their own homes, um, as well as uh, mechanical contractors and testing ductwork. Um, but the state developed a, a one-day training program that would allow individuals to get certified, while at the same time they recognized that the, the common uh, industry certifications could be accepted as well. So this, um, in the US, that's the Home Energy Rating System, um, the Building Performance Institute Building Analyst uh, Certification. Those are industry certifications that already exist that they recognize as uh, individuals who can also perform this testing. And what it really does, it, this is, the barrier that this addresses is, uh, is a lack of resources in, in for uh, code officials and being able to do this. So their, their program actually relieves local code officials of having to do the testing themselves. So you know, obviously when it comes to um, energy code enforcement, it's, it, it's where the rubber hits the road. You know, that's, it's really where the savings from the code that you've developed and, and got adopted are realized. And so um, as, I, as I close out here, um, here's my contact information. Please stay in touch if you have questions on um, energy code enforcement in the US. Uh, my email is there as well as the IMT website. Um, and all of the resources that I've uh, shown here are available on the IMT website. So now I'm going to turn it over to John Lee from New York City. He's going to give you um, their local perspective on, on their energy code enforcement. Thank you, Ryan. Um, can I confirm from Sean that you're able to see my screen? Yep, see you, see your screen, and hear you just fine. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, and my name is John Lee. I'm with the New York City Mayor's Office, and I will be speaking to 
the uh, enforcement program that was put together at the Department of Buildings uh, pertaining to the New York City Energy Conservation uh, Construction Code. Um, I first wanted to uh, go through just some background on the enforcement regime in New York City as it pertains to codes. And this first slide is uh, partly to uh, impress you out there in the audience that we are a city of nearly 8.3 million people. And within New York City is um, close to 1 million buildings. And the permit activity that's uh, uh, generated, uh, that the construction um, is generated through construction is uh, estimated to be somewhere to the order of $10 billion a year. And in order to address uh, code com uh, compliance in general, I'm not talking about just the energy code, but the construction codes and the mechanical and plumbing codes uh, and fuel gas codes that accompany that, that the Department of Buildings uh, employs over a thousand persons, um, of which there are over 300 inspectors and uh, almost 200 plan examiners that are distributed over several department offices, and they're primarily um, uh, headquartered within each of the five boroughs that comprise uh, New York City. <clears throat> You'll see that um, in 2011, uh, nearly half a million plan reviews were conducted, and in total, um, about you know, 143,000 uh, work permits were issued. And this uh, work permit application uh, does generate a revenue source for the Department of Buildings. Um, in, again, in fiscal year 2011, it generated about $165 million in revenues. Uh, much of this was allocated towards the uh, salaries of the personnel uh, that went into uh, conducting the plan examination and the uh, inspections that, um, that accompany those, uh, those permits. Uh, these uh, you know, over 1,000 employees um, covering you know, the 144,000 work, work permits that were issued, uh, that, that uh, what seems like a small standing army is actually inadequate in order to address the entire uh, permit universe and volume that comes into New York City. And to that extent, uh, much of the uh, compliance is uh, deferred to the um, to the licensed professional um, in a program that we called uh, professional certification by which a uh, licensed engineer or a licensed architect can submit plans and attest to their full code compliance and be issued uh, permits based on uh, the good standing of their license. Those uh, permit applications are then subject to a, a randomly selected enforcement audit. And the Department of Buildings uh, maintains a 20% uh, random selection rate, um, which then drawings are pulled. Uh, if there is found to be um, uh, not compliance issues uh, that would warrant uh, an amendment to the plans, then the department has the authority to uh, place a stop work order on the permit until the, uh, the compliance issues have been resolved. Um, this also gives a mechanism to the department as a discipline action to go after uh, someone's filing privileges with the department, again, based on their license, <coughs> uh, for those, um, the, the worst actors and the, the, that would have required the most uh, deep uh, uh, enforce or, or uh, sort of punitive measure. Uh, one thing I will also add before I leave this slide is I wanted to show on the upper right hand side of the slide is the uh, permit volume for Manhattan, and then below that is Brooklyn and Manhattan and Brooklyn being the two largest boroughs uh, in terms of uh, construction activity in New York City. Uh, please note first that the y-axis scale on here are slightly different. But I just wanted to point out that there's a distinction made on this slide between what's called an NB Alt 1 versus Alt 2 and Alt 3. And that's just describing the kinds of permits that are issued by the Department of Buildings. NB refers to new building. Alt 1 is a significant alteration that changes the use of the building. And then Alt 2 and 3 are the more minor alterations that would typically be um, considered a renovation or repair. This is actually a fairly crude um, way to describe a very nuanced picture. Um, within this uh, universe of Alt 2 and 3, um, it can be as significant as a you know, full apartment renovation considered as an alteration or even just a um, 
a swap of a sprinkler fire pump would be considered a minor alteration too. And then within New York City, even though there may be an overarching new building permit that is pulled, um, there, the, the regime allows for permit, uh, any construction job to be chopped up into multiple permits across several disciplines. So any given job site may have uh, a dozen, two dozen different permits, permits pulled for that, uh, for that job related to their separate disciplines, again, around construction activity. Um, again, they, they could be carved up in many different ways, and also mechanical systems, electrical, and plumbing systems could be permitted separately. Um, within uh, New York City, uh, there is a large degree of uh, local jurisdictional control over the building codes. Uh, earlier in Ryan's um, uh, presentation, he showed the uh, the county by county breakup of New York State, which um, is uh, subject to the New York State uh, construction codes. However, in New York City, uh, and this is part of the executive law in New York City, New, uh, New York State, um, this city of New York is allowed to um, to uh, legislate their own building codes and uh, take enforcement action uh, independent of the uh, rest of New York State. The way that it works around energy codes is slightly different, and uh, I won't get too deep into the nuance, but just to say that there is an overarching New York State Energy Conservation Construction Code, and in 2009, New York City legislated its own New York City Energy Conservation Code, which is based on the background New York State Code. Again, this is also based on the uh, International Code Council's Model Energy Conservation Code. And w what this did, which was the most important thing um, that happened in 2009, was under the uh, state code that was in effect at that time, there was this so-called schedule of a, a building project is that the, the, the developer has got a, an idea and he starts to design. And he notices the, the municipality building board about the project and then the municipality invites the, the developer to a technical consultation where uh, the developer presents the project. And uh, Together, the, the building board and the developer takes uh, and makes a control plan what, what is, that is agreed on. Uh, and uh, the control responsible person is presented by the, the developer and the building board has to, to approve this person to be the control responsible. And uh, at this stage, a uh, a uh, starting permission is given by the, the building board. Uh, and uh, during the erecting phase, the, the control responsible performs controls decided in the control plan. And for the energy control, there, there are two different phases. First, uh, you can tell them uh, um, the developer to, to um, or the control responsible to do uh, control of calculated values during the project as the project proceeds. And then there is a second phase and that is uh, the control of the measured values that are measured during the second season of use. And uh, the building board can, depending on, on uh, how well known and and uh, and, uh, and uh, the competence of, of the the organization of the the developer, uh, the building board decides uh, whether or which of these methods that are are appropriate to to uh, to uh, apply on on the certain project. And uh, 
when uh, if if they are told to to make the both checks when it differs between the two methods the second uh, method the control of the measured values is the reference method so uh, that that uh, makes the the developer to to uh, develop projects that are uh, uh, has got a safety original and so far in uh, in Sweden we have the country divided in three climatic zones we are starting to to uh, change that but so far we use the three zones and um, the, the safety margin in these zones is it's as you know Sweden as a, a country stretching from the south to the north uh, the, the the zones are divided uh, so there are about three similar size uh, areas and um, if you're looking at the, the buildings built in, in uh, one of those zones, you, you see in the north, in the coldest part of the zone, the building, the, the safety marginal is about 10%. And uh, in the south part of the climate zone, it's uh, between 35 or 40% better than the, the building code. Uh, during the using phase, um, the, or when, when the building is finished, the, the building board gives the, the developer a, a permit which is a must to be allowed to use the building. Uh, but when it comes to energy and radon, uh, the permit is just an interim permit. Uh, for radon it's because uh, in Sweden you have to to uh, measure radon during the heating season. And if the building is, is finished in, in the summer, you can't present a, a uh, radon measurement. And the energy, uh, because of the, the second point of the compliance control plan. And uh, sanctions not doing this. Uh, that uh, could be uh, used by the building board is that uh, the owner can be uh, told not to be allowed to use the building or they can get an injunction of correction or when it's very bad not perhaps not when it comes to energy but to other uh, requirements such as uh, strength and so of the building it could be in an injunction of demolition uh, and uh, to correct this uh, there could be a fine deemed and uh, as uh, the national board has nothing uh, to do with this uh, process with the control responsible and uh, the developer and the building board uh, we have uh, some years ago according to the energy performance of buildings directive started to uh, do some energy certificates uh, that went in force in the beginning of 2007 and uh, this building certificates is to be uh, presented uh, according to the, the period measured in the point seven of the uh, control plan so uh, these two laws or uh, they, they are uh, strengthening each other's and uh, why we have use choose to to use measured values well before uh, 2006 we uh, had uh, calculated values to show uh, the energy use and then we found out when checking out uh, there could be projects that uh, differed up to 250 percent of the, the calculated values and since we um, changed from uh, calculated to measured values we have seen a, a decrease in the energy use in this certification register 
since it, this control system went into force. And uh, this, uh, when it takes part of the control system, the municipality chooses within the two ways of handling uh, the compliance checks in the control plan. But the energy certificate always has to be made. And uh, the role of the National Board of Housing Building and Planning is that uh, we ha have got the, the checking if the, the certificates are made. And uh, the effect of this, uh, when we are following uh, the energy statistics in the National Energy Certificate Register, we can see a trend of lower energy use in buildings erected after the operational ratings compliance checks was introduced in 2006. And there has been some difficulties um, since the municipalities um, once in a while doesn't choose any of the methods. Uh, and uh, before 2012, the, the municipalities had the supervision over the energy certificates. It wasn't always uh, checked as it should have been. Uh, and in some cases, uh, the, the building is sold before it is ready, and then there there is. Uh, a demand that you should have an energy certificate already when you sell it. And then uh, you can only make the compliance check out of this energy certificate that is only calculated. So there's some problems. And um, this was uh, my presentation. Hello. Thank you very much, um, and thank you to the rest of the presenters for the, the wonderful presentations today. We do, um, at this point, we have quite a few questions from the audience, so we'll move on to those and address those. Uh, and I'd just like to remind the audience that if they do have any questions, please submit them through the questions bar or pane in the GoToWebinars um, box there on your screen. And so the way we'll do the question and answer session is I will read out the questions that I have received. If um, some of these are addressed to specific panelists, but if they are not, um, then feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, address the question. And so the first one that I received today um, just asked, so um, with building codes, if they, this was during the first uh, presentation during Ryan, they were asking if the building codes are not um, mandatory, um, why? How would they be enforced if they are voluntary? Yeah. Okay, this is Ryan. I'll take that. Um, good question. So they're not. They're the building codes are not mandatory at the national level. They, when a state adopts a code, it it, it then becomes mandatory. Uh, with a, a state or a local jurisdiction uh, being a city or a county, then it becomes mandatory. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that at the at the national level, there is not a mandatory code. There's only model codes. Uh, which the states then adopt as mandatory. Great, thank you. And Ryan, this next one's for you too. Um, they were wondering where the case studies that you were referencing can be found, or if they are available. Yes, they're all available. Um, you can go to imt.org, and you'll find them under the codes tab there. Great, and I'll I'll send up that link as well. That was imt.org. Yep, imt.org. Yep. And uh, the next question we have is, does the energy um, inspections and analysis, do they have to be completed by an external resource, or can it be done by a qualified building and housing resource? Uh, you want me to take that? <laughs> um, sure, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll do a quick to In terms of the, um, this is Ryan, in terms of my presentation when it came to um, the actual uh, assessments, so they can be done internally or by um, or by a third party, a consultant that's brought in. Um, but 
it's it's really up to the to, to who to the jurisdiction that is uh, that's conducting it. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I can also go, answer yeah, from, from Sweden. Uh, the assessors of the, the the certification system has so far has been mandatory to belong to uh, an accredited uh, company. Which, and there is three different types of accreditation, where one of them are that you can be a part of the, the company, but, but then you have to be uh, in a well-divided part of the company, so they don't, uh, they're not allowed to, to uh, work within the same part of the company that is erecting the building. But normally it is done by a third party. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question we have um, states, in, in New York City and other cities, is there any effort to verify energy models beyond looking at the proposed energy cost compared to the budget? Uh, this is John Lee from New York City. Uh, yes, that is part of the uh, verification process that the, plant, the new plan examiners will be conducting that along with the uh, energy cost budget model form that is submitted, they also have to, um, if they are picked up for an audit or as part of a, a, a prior to approval plan examination, they will have to demonstrate um, the correlations between their energy model and what was input into the energy cost budget to confirm the validity of the model. Great, thank you. And um, we have two questions that are in regards to the ARA program. Um, the first is, is there a system in place to check the compliance rates in New York or the U.S. in general as part of ARA? And the second part to that question is, um, what, has there, is there any information on the progress achieved by the ARA program? Uh, has it made a significant impact on code compliance? Um, I guess, again, this is John Lee, and I guess that this question is directed towards me since I'm the one that brought it up. But um, I would say, and I apologize for this being very bureaucratic, but I can't really comment on that because it's not part of the city's obligation here at this point. Um, again, this is something that's deferred to the state, and um, while we, the, the activity that we are doing for uh, compliance will ultimately feed into uh, the state's uh, program to demonstrate their compliance with 9517. Um, we are under no obligation uh, as a city to uh, implement and uh, develop that plan. So uh, again, I apologize for the bureaucratic answer, but I, um, I would rather defer to other experts to answer that question. Yeah, this is Ryan. I can take that one. Um, I can give the non-bureaucratic answer to that. Um, so the, the Department of Energy did a series of pilot studies uh, a couple of years ago to come up with a methodology for um, conducting compliance assessments. Uh, they more or less expect the states to then take, the, take that methodology or some version thereof and conduct their own assessments. However, there is no, currently there's no funding uh, uh, dedicated to the states to be able to do that. It's the responsibility of these states to, um, to take on that obligation of conducting their own assessments and then reporting their results to the Department of Energy. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question is for Handala. And the question is, how frequently are fines imposed for noncompliance? Well, um, I don't have the figure of that because uh, that is uh, within the municipalities. But uh, since we last year took over the, the checking of the energy certificates, we have uh, been sending out uh, a lot of uh, letters to, to building owners that hasn't done their, their uh, homework, so to say. Uh, with uh, we have a 
possibility to force them to, to uh, make energy certifications. And that uh, is uh, within the whole system of energy certification. So could also be, be in uh, elder buildings that is uh, within the system. So uh, I don't have uh, the quite the, the figure yet, but uh, we are, uh, so far we have, uh, I think, uh, sent out um, letters to, to owners of, of uh, about 10,000 10, buildings to, to do uh, energy certification. So. And th this uh, register of ours, we are, are going to plan a, uh, a uh, cooperation with uh, the Society of Municipalities to do uh, some work to, to make it easier for the municipalities to use our uh, certification register to go in and check. So if they tell us that there is a new building built, we uh, uh, well we can get that also from the the land survey uh, authority and then we can t tell the the building owner to to make a a, a new buildings certificate and um, the municipality can force them to to uh, do it with the fines and so on great thank you Hanzo. Um, and the next question brings us back to the New York City, and it asks, what is New York City's definition of an alteration type one? Is it based on value or on the area affected by the works? And is it similar to e the EU definition of major renovation? Um, I wouldn't characterize that definition as being similar to anyone else's, and it's fairly nuanced. Um, the, I guess the easiest way to describe it is that the alteration type one is a significant alteration that ultimately changes the use of the building. And um, that would help caveat also what is described as an alteration type two, which can also be a major alteration but is not uh, affecting the main use of the building. Um, so the uh, again, I would not align it with other jurisdictions definitions, um, but just for the uh, ease of doing these high level uh, metrics and also trying to describe the universe that's in New York City, um, I drew those distinctions along these lines, but uh, I would uh, emphasize that you have to take into consideration that these aren't very neat definitions, and the most clear distinction being that change of use between an ALT-1 and an ALT-2. All right, thank you. Um, and another question for um, the New York City. And it asks, could you speak about how the building department enforces energy code violations? Is it through stop work orders, fines, or otherwise? And also, do they have any energy code items that have to be verified post-certificate of occupancy? Uh, with the scheme that's in place um, for the new building and alteration type 1 applications that are subject to the energy code review, um, they cannot pull a permit until uh, they demonstrate full compliance on the construction drawings with the energy code. Um, it is only then that they get the um, the uh, the, the permit. Uh, for all other jobs that are subject to a random selection audit, in many cases the permit has already been issued, but through the enforcement audit, uh, if they find that there are um, uh, non-compliance issues that need the, the sort of drawings to be amended and the scope of work possibly be amended, then the department can issue a stop work order on the permit until the objections have been resolved. Um, in terms of the inspections, um, there is a prior to close out uh, progress inspection uh, requirement. So if any of the inspection items have either been unfulfilled or um, failed and were not corrected, then 
the uh, applicant can't submit that final progress inspection report, and which means that the permit would not be closed out, which subsequently means that the certificate of occupancy will not be issued. Uh, th those um, are the major um, uh, actions that the Department of Buildings can take in terms of how it will affect the, uh, the progress of the permit. Great, thanks. And uh, back to Hans Olaf for this question. How are the operational energy targets in Sweden developed for complex commercial buildings? Well, um, so far, um, until this, until the next alteration of building codes, uh, we have only so far worked with um, uh, residential and non-residential building codes and uh, also we have difference between electrical heated and, and uh, not electrical heated buildings but uh, if the, the building has got different types of uh, uh, well a mix of, of uh, non-residential and residential it's divided into the uh, the area of the, the Well, the, the area of the, the, the sort of, a, uh, well, you have the part of the, the, where the dwelling is, has to comply to the dwelling code and, and uh, the part with the, the non-residentials has to comply with that part and uh, it's sort of a mix. Great, thank you, Hans Olaf. Um, and the next question is to any panelist, and it is financing is always an issue with increasing training or improving other methods to achieve better code compliance. Uh, how do, uh, how have you seen ways of tackling this issue? Uh, this is Ryan. I guess I'll take a stab at that one. Um, I'm not sure I follow, followed the question completely, but um, I, I think it, it's in, in reference to uh, funding for uh, for code compliance uh, initiatives. And one of the case studies that I did is on streamlining, and that's probably the one that addresses the. It, it certainly addresses the issue from from the local um, jurisdiction standpoint, in that it essentially puts out their uh, solutions and, and and methods of that local building departments can follow in order to uh, to streamline their processes and w which almost always will lead to um, them being able to do things uh, more quickly and efficiently and therefore allowing them time to uh, to focus on the energy code and that's without specifically allocating uh, funding for it because oftentimes you know trying to implement a new fee or, or raise permit fees uh, is becomes a very uh, political issue and so this is a way to be able to uh, get compliance without specifically having to uh, to raise fees um, or, or try to bring on other staff uh, in order to do that This is uh, Jens, well, I would like to Sweden, tip in here. Okay. Uh, let's go with Jens first and then we'll go on yeah. to um, the other panelists. Was it to me? <laughs> I, um, I would like to tip in that there is a couple of uh, places where we have seen that you pay a fee for, for the uh, building permit um, and this way you pay for some of the control uh, or as the case, I guess we will tip in on this one too, that you uh, request a certification which is made by an independent uh, consultant and you have to pay for him uh, to submit this uh, certificate for the uh, um, community so that they can check whether you fulfill the requirement or not. And if the price for a thing like that is um, a couple of hundred euros or a couple of hundred US dollars, it's, it's a very little price compared to the construction cost just of a 
one family house which might be half a million or even more. Uh, so it's not a very big amount that you need to, to claim from those people. And then uh, at least the um, city hall doesn't have a, an excuse not to enforce the building code because they get money to do it. So uh, that's one possibility. Yeah, and uh, on sort of here. Uh, well, in Sweden, uh, the developer has to, according to the law, has to know about uh, buildings and so on. But uh, the municipality judges the organization around the developer to see if, if it's uh, good enough, so to say. Uh, and if they find that the organization around the developer hasn't got the, the skills of energy, for example, uh, showed in their uh, background papers and so on, they, they can uh, tell the, the developer to uh, hire uh, an energy expert that is certified. And it's the same kind of energy expert that can, can make, but not this, couldn't be the same one, but uh, si same type of uh, energy expert doing the certificate of the building later on. So, uh, if the developer hasn't got an energy expert in his organization, they, they have to hire one uh, certified to, to um, be able to. And then there is the certified control responsible to, to uh, check the, the, the project during the, the time of the project. Thank you, Hans Olaf and Yen. Um, we have time for one more quick question. If everyone, um, I th believe this uh, applies to everyone. If you could just maybe 20 seconds um, providing an answer to this, it would be great. The question is, are there additional references, studies, or studies for enforcement procedures, templates, things like that? Any resources that our audience could use to uh, find out more about uh, any aspects of this? And we can go right in order with uh, Ryan first, if you have some additional references or studies for the audience. Um, I'm not going to name a specific one, but I'll, I'll bring up a resource. And it's energycodesocean.org. And that is a website run by the Building Codes Assistance Project. And they have a compliance portal on there, which has a wide variety of, uh, of ways to improve compliance. Great. And uh, John or Hans Olaf, if you have uh, anything. This is John Lee from New York City. Uh, I would point to the New York City Department of Buildings uh, website, which is at www.nyc.gov forward slash buildings. And there's an entire page devoted to energy code guidelines. and. Um, what I would like to say is that the presentation I gave was uh, pretty high level, but you know when it comes down to the very uh, nuanced and detailed, detailed definitions and methods by which uh, uh, specific uh, items would be regulated, uh, they are uh, laid out in uh, uh, much more excruciating detail on the Department of Buildings website uh, through a number of uh, bulletins which uh, uh, described uh, procedures and policies that aren't uh, clearly addressed by the codes as well as uh, general guidance on how to conform to the, the New York City regime. And I'll sort of here, and uh, I can give uh, one uh, link as well, uh, and that is to the uh, implementation, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, a uh, booklet uh, featuring a uh, country reports from 2012 with the different uh, countries involved in the concerted action for energy performance of buildings directive and that is www.epbd-ca.eu where I think you can find this booklet uh, describing the different countries of Europe and the, all the, the different parts of the 
energy work according to the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, where there are um, the demands for the, the levels of the building codes and uh, and the certification of uh, buildings and, and so on. Great, thank you. Um, and now real quick, we're going to go back over to Yen to on to make some closing remarks before we finish up. And I just ask the audience to stick around. Also, we have a very brief survey that we'll do after that. Thank you. Uh, I will mention a paper, too, made by the World Bank uh, called Mainstreaming Building Energy Efficiency Codes in Developing Countries, which is made by Feng Liu, Anke Meyer, and John Hogan. Uh, some of them might be known to you. Anyway, uh, I would also thank everybody who have participated in this webinar um, and who have helped us to scope up uh, new material discussions on how to implement uh, good building codes. Um, we thank all the speakers. Uh, it was our aim to get people, those everyday heroes who are developing building codes and trying to implement them, and very often they are not uh, getting well treated for that, and uh, they never get a, an award or, or a thing like that. They work in uh, silence, and this was an idea of having some of them to tell about their experiences, uh, which other people could learn a lot from. And we have learned a lot ourselves. To mention the team here, and especially me, McDonald's, who have been putting these webinars together and done the work with comparison, talking with the speakers, and and all of these things. So I hope it has been useful for all of you. And we would like to come back soon. Uh, maybe we will focus next time on renovation policies. Uh, but we could definitely also, in the future, come back with something about building codes in maybe in hot and humid climates, where, where it's a different task uh, again. So I hope you uh, got something out of these webinars. We definitely did. Uh, and we hope to see you back in webinars again in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jens. And um, now we just ask the audience to answer three quick uh, survey questions that we have that just help us improve uh, the webinar and get some feedback. Maureen, if you could show that first question, please. And the question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And the next question. The webinar's presenters were effective. And then the final question. Overall, the webinar met my expectations. Great. Thank you very much for answering on our survey. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd just like to thank um, the panelists and the attendees for participating in today's webinar. Uh, please go out to the Clean Energy Solutions Center um, dot org training page over the next few days if you'd like to listen to an audio recording of today's webinar and view the slides. They are posted. The slides are posted up there right now. Uh, the audio recording will take a few days to get up there. Uh, and feel free to share this information with those in your networks and organizations. So uh, thank you, and this concludes our webinar. <laughs>